Hi everyone, uh, my name is Duncan, and yeah, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of our firmware stack, and in particular, our focus on verified boot and security. Um, so first off, I'm going to talk a bit about why we care about firmware and why we invest so much in it. I'm going to talk about verified boot, as I mentioned, and then the components that make up the firmware architecture that we ship, uh, and then a little bit about how we do firmware updates, because they are a little bit different from the rest of the Chrome OS update. Uh, so first up, why do we care about firmware? Why is it important to us? Um, there's a lot of answers for this, but the couple that I've highlighted here, um, it gives us a lot of knowledge about the piece of hardware that we're going to build. And so every generation, the SOCs are getting more and more complicated, and they're requiring more and more effort just to get them up and running. And so when you're trying to design hardware and ship high-quality devices and you actually get them into the market at the same time everyone else does, you really need to understand the piece of hardware that you're building so that you can debug it when bugs eventually show up. Because they will be found, uh, and every bug that's found is generally tagged as a firmware bug first until we can prove that it's either a kernel bug or a hardware bug. Um, often if it's a hardware bug, it's still the firmware's responsibility because we have to find a workaround and come up with a way to actually ship that hardware. The second reason is it gives us a lot of control of the platforms that we're building. And this allows us to do things like have a consistent behavior across all of our products so that every Chromebook will boot up really fast. It will all wake up the same. It'll have the same wake sources so that when you open the lid, the system wakes up. Um, it also allows us to maximize the power and the performance of the hardware that we're building. Because we have the knowledge of the platform we're building, we're working closely with the SOC vendors. We can do tuning for the performance and the power of the system. Um, and then finally, it allows us to create new interfaces for the firmware and the OS. And the, obviously, the biggest one of these is Verified Boot itself. Um, Verified Boot is designed to provide a secure platform for users. Uh, it's designed to provide a recovery method that users can use to get back to a trusted state for that platform. And it also allows users to turn off this verification if they'd like to develop on the system or just to check it out in a little more detail. So the common mode that you'll see with a Chrome OS device when you first turn it on, or what most of you probably have today, is that it's in verified mode. And in this case, it's doing a full verification of every step of the boot process. The firmware is verified, the kernel is verified, and that root file system is verified. And if something fails during that verification, either because the hardware has a problem or if it's actually been corrupted, either accidentally or maliciously, the system will not boot into the kernel, and instead it will boot into recovery mode. And so what you'll see is this screen on the top left here where it's got the big yellow bang and it says Chrome OS is missing or damaged. And recovery mode is designed to allow users to return their device back to a trusted state either because it was compromised maliciously or because they just want to make sure that they're on a clean version of the OS. Um, recovery mode is a special mode of the firmware. We don't allow you to boot from the internal storage that might be there. So if you had a compromised kernel installed, recovery mode would never even look at it or attempt to boot it. So it only boots a signed USB stick using a recovery key, which is different from the normal keys that we use for booting the system. And so as I mentioned, you can fall into recovery mode for a hardware failure if for some reason you fail to verify. But you can also get into recovery mode intentionally. So if you wanted to boot a recovery image, you can do a uh, physical presence check, which on a modern Chromebook looks like holding down the escape key, the refresh key, and then pressing the power key. And that will trigger every piece of hardware in the system to reset cleanly and come up in its read-only mode. And so when it's in this recovery mode, it's only using read-only firmware. So the firmware will stay in read-only. It will not verify any read-write. The EC will also stay in its read-only. Uh, this allows us to reflash all of the read-write firmware from that recovery image. And it also, uh, beyond booting these images, you can actually then switch to developer mode and turn off verification. And so developer mode, as I mentioned, is designed to allow you to turn off verification and run your own code on the system. And whenever you turn this enable developer mode, you will see this warning screen that you see on the top right here, indicating that OS verification is off and asking you to press space to re-enable. And this is designed for users that don't really understand developer mode or don't, don't intend for their system to be in developer mode, so they can tell every time they boot that system up that it's not verified properly. And it's really easy for them to re-enable just by pressing space and confirming. Um, developer mode provides the next level of access to the system. You get a root shell. You get the ability to run your own kernels. Uh, you can even turn off root file system verification and mo manage the root file system. Uh, you can set flags that let you boot from USB or boot from an alternate firmware, which we can include in the, in the system. Um, and as I mentioned, you require physical presence to enable this so that you can't have some ro remote attacker that figures out how to transition your system to developer mode without the user knowing. 
And because we ship a lot of Chromebooks into enterprises and education especially, it's actually possible to disable developer mode because we have a lot of scenarios where the owner of the device may not be the same person that uses the device. And so if a school district buys a bunch of laptops, they want to ensure that the students are not doing stuff with those laptops that they don't want them to do. And so the enterprise owner for an enterprise enrolled device can set a flag that will turn off developer mode. If you try and boot in developer mode, it will recognize that this device shouldn't have it enabled, and it'll turn it back off for you. And so you get in this loop. It's kind of like that little box where the cat comes out and pushes the button. Um, and so whenever you transition between developer mode and, and normal mode, we clear all of the user data um, from the TPM. We wipe the keys. Uh, and then the OS will attempt to wipe the storage itself to ensure that there's no user data left on there at all. And then the next step beyond this is you can actually take complete ownership of your device. Uh, our devices, you can disable the write protect. Uh, most of them, that requires opening the device up. Uh, and then you can, once you've done that, then you can do various things with it. You can set flags that uh, shorten this developer screen timeout. Uh, you can force developer mode to stay enabled so that pressing space won't disable it, because that can be a problem if you want to be in developer mode and someone presses space at boot. Um, and you can also set a flag that turns on verification of the kernel. So you can be in developer mode and still have a secure kernel and root file system. Uh, and then if you really wanted to own your device, you could generate a new set of keys, put those keys into the firmware, and ensure that your firmware can only boot kernels that you've signed and not kernels that Google has signed. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can download the firmware for your device from coreboot.org, build it, and have it boot however you want. At this point, it probably isn't running Chrome OS anymore. Um, so how do we make all this work? What's the process for verified boot? Well, as I mentioned, it's designed to verify each next step in the firmware chain. And it starts with the root of trust that comes from read-only spy flash. And this is a hardware write protection method where a region of the spy flash chip is read-only. And that region contains things like the first instructions that execute, and in, in fact, all of the code necessary to verify the next step. And it also contains the public keys that we use to verify each next step of the firmware. Um, and so the read-only firmware is responsible for verifying read-write. Read-write firmware verifies the kernel, and the kernel verifies the root file system. And so now to get a little bit more detail into each of these, I'm glossing over a whole lot of detail here. Uh, you can go look at design docs on chromium.org for a lot more information. But the idea is that read-only firmware comes up and finds that root key in read-only flash. And then that uses it to decrypt or to verify a key block that contains the actual data key that is used to verify the actual firmware itself. That uh, uh, preamble also includes a subkey that is used to verify the kernel. So we get to the next step. When we want to verify the kernel, it uses that subkey that it pulled out earlier to verify the kernel's data key. And then the kernel data key will verify the actual kernel body itself. And in a Chrome OS system, the kernel body that's verified includes the kernel image plus the command line that's passed to the kernel. And this way, you can't modify command line options and pass them to the kernel without actually re-signing the entire thing. And one of those command line options that's passed in includes the hash that's used to verify the root file system. And file system verification is done with a kernel level uh, subsystem called DM Verity that was written by Chromium people a long time ago. Uh, and it's now used in more than just Chrome OS. I believe Android is using this today. Uh, and file system verification is done by building that uh, image that you're going to use for your root file system. It's going to be mounted read only, so you don't have to worry about it being changed. And so once you've built that image, you hash every block in the image. And then you structure each of these hashes into bundles and put all these bundles into a big tree. And at the top of the tree, you have one hash that can be used to verify the next level of bundle hashes. And so you can actually go all the way back down and read out any block and verify it all the way up. And so that initial root hash is specified on the kernel command line so that if you change the root file system, you can actually change that hash and keep things going. Um, and once the blocks are read and hashed, they're actually stored in the page cache so that if you access it again shortly thereafter, you wouldn't have to do the full verification again. And so how do we make all this work? What's the pieces that go together here? Um, so our Chrome OS architecture for firmware, like, like the rest of Chrome OS, we try very hard to use open source where possible. We've done a lot of work in open source uh, firmware communities. Uh, and so, but it's not always possible. There's definitely vendors who have secret sauce that they do not want to be public. And so we also have support for integrating with some vendor binaries that might do things that the vendor doesn't want to be public. And because all these components are somewhat independent, we have a lot of flexibility. We can define APIs that pass data between them, but we don't necessarily have to worry about one thing directly impacting another, unless it's changing one of those APIs. 
Um, and we actually have three copies of this firmware in the flash. One for recovery mode, which is all in read-only, and then two in read-write so that we can do updates. We run out of one and we update the other. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So the main piece that makes up the firmware is called Coreboot. And this is a open source project that was probably started about 20 years ago by a man named Ron Minnick. Uh, he works here at Google now. He's working on, actually he was in Chrome West for a while and he's, now he's working on production side. Um, it's very much designed for code sharing and reuse. So you can go to coreboot.org today and find all of the SOCs, all of the boards that we have shipped Chromebooks with, and they're all in the same tree, uh, and they're all up to date in that same place. Now, some of the early boards may not be as up to date. Uh, some changes may not always make their way upstream uh, for the older stuff. We have switched to working upstream first now. So all of the code that we put in for a new board goes in first at coreboot.org and then makes its way back down to Chromium. Uh, this has really allowed us to not have to worry about the upstreaming later problem that we ran into. Um, and the way we do boards within Coreboot is uh, based around the same way we do our reference boards here in Chrome OS. So when we set out to build a new platform, let's say Cabby Lake Y, which is the pixel book, we define a platform, we, we design a reference board for Cabby Lake Y, and then Chrome OS team will take that reference board and design all the firmware around it and all the OS support around it. And then that will become the baseboard inside of Coreboot. And so whenever an OEM decides they want to make a product based on Cabby Lake Y, like Pixelbook, it can become a variant of that baseboard. And so that means it doesn't need to re-implement and doesn't need to copy and paste everything from that baseboard just to change maybe a couple of GPIOs. It can overlay various files and just change small pieces at once. Uh, and this has really allowed us to uh, scale our firmware development so that adding a new variant of a Cabby Lake Y system is really trivial today. Um, and Coreboot itself is responsible for doing the verify boot selection and picking which read-write firmware we're going to execute. Uh, and it also has all of the common BIOS things that you'll see a normal BIOS do, ACPI code, uh, SMM, although we use very little SMM, and lots of event logging because we use the event log to understand what happened to the system when users filed feedback. Uh, from Core Boot, we go into our OS bootloader. Uh, this is called Depth Charge. We used to use U-Boot, uh, and so what you use to sync a U-Boot, you use a Depth Charge. Uh, <laughs> this is because the OS bootloader is separate from the BIOS itself, it gave us a lot of flexibility in designing a bootloader that's all about booting Chrome OS. And so Depth Charge is very much responsible for doing the kernel selection and the verification. And it's also the one that interacts with the Verify Boot Library to handle all of those firmware screens and the transitions between recovery mode and developer mode and normal mode and things like that. Um, because it's responsible for verifying the kernel, that means it has drivers necessary to do that work. So it has drivers for USB and all the internal storage you might see in a system. Um, there are some requirements for accessibility where if a blind user is in developer mode, we need them to know that they're in developer mode. So after that 30 second screen is displayed, we beep the system so that there's some warning that, uh, that you're not in a safe verified mode. And then we also have a display engine so we can draw all these firmware screens. And so and they all cannot be localized to the local languages. Uh, going down the stack, we have the embedded controller. Uh, and this is a chip that you will find in every laptop out there and a lot of uh, it's coming into more and more desktops these days. Uh, we initially set out and we did not own this piece of firmware. This was written by the ODMs for the boards that they designed. This is very common in the industry. Um, and when we worked with these first set of systems, every embedded controller behaved slightly differently. They all had different bugs, but we had to integrate them and make them all work nicely inside and make them all behave the same for Chrome OS. And that was a real challenge. Uh, working, it's the same with uh, closed source BIOS, trying to work with a vendor on a binary that they produce for you. If you have a bug, you've got to, you know, especially because they're generally overseas, you've got a multi-day turnaround time just to get a fix, and then you have to see if it's actually fixed. Um, so we designed our own embedded controller, starting with the first Chromebook Pixel, and it's been used in all the Chromebooks since then. Uh, this firmware is BSD licensed. We ship it as all open source code, but it is possible to use, and I, people are using it in other designs. Um, it supports a read-only and read-write firmware split as well, but it's a little different from how we do it in the BIOS. Um, the EC generally is not as, well, obviously is not powerful as powerful as the SOC, so if it was to do its own verification and do its own firmware selection, uh, it would take a lot longer and it would impact boot time. So for the most part, we manage the EC's running version from the host side, where the process is called software sync. So at boot time, if we detect that 
Uh, we do a hash of the EC, the code that is running. We ask the EC for its hash and compare it to what we have in our update area. And if they're different, then the OS will push down a new update to the EC and then jump to it and continue to boot the system. And so that way, every time there's a firmware update, we can also update the EC at the same time. Going even further down, uh, we have our security controller. And if you went to Andre's talk yesterday, you learned about this a little bit. Um, you will hear it referred to in, as various things working on Chrome OS, uh, Haven, uh, H1, CR50. So CR50 is actually what we call the firmware. Uh, Haven was the original project name, and H1 is the more H1 secure microcontroller or something is the official name. Um, this particular chip is used in a lot of Google products. It's used in our data centers for verification as well. Uh, for us, it provides TPM functionality that allowed us to replace the TPMs that we had on the boards before and save some costs that way. It also gave us some of the debug controls that we had on the boards that we were using with a debug board called Servo. Um, so having this allows us to replace that interface. Um, the secure microcontroller controls the write protect signal in new devices. Uh, and that means that you can actually disable write protect uh, without having to open the system up. And because it has access to all sorts of things, uh, it allows us to do some interesting case closed debugging where you can use a debug cable that we call SUSEQ that plugs in from a type A port on your desktop to the type C port, only port zero, on a Chromebook. And once you've plugged in and you can get access then to the consoles, both for this microcontroller itself, for the embedded controller, and for the SOC. So you actually can get three serial consoles out. Um, and you can actually flash the firmwares if you needed to debug the system further. Um, doing some of these things, like flashing the firmware, requires you to go through some steps to unlock your device so that you can actually prove that you own it and it's not some device owned by your school district. Uh, but you can get access to the serial console, especially for the host, with no issues. And so for kernel developers, it's really handy now to be able to plug in one cable and get serial console access. Uh, going, I guess, even further down, we have the vendor binaries. So an example here is Intel. Uh, I've worked mostly with Intel products, and so I've been a lot involved in the Intel FSP. Uh, this is the firmware support package, and this is a specification that we developed with Intel that sort of grew out of some of the work that we did early on where we created our own vendor binaries based on the reference code that Intel supplied. So Intel took that, and today they produce binaries for the reference code, and they put them on intel.com, and people can download the binaries. We have a source license with Google, so, or with Intel, so we can actually build it from source. Uh, we can debug it from source as well. Um, and that is because we, are, we work with Intel. We co-develop with Intel on any new uh, platforms that we're going to support. Um, and so we generally need to have access to the source to understand what we're working on. Um, this vendor binary does things that they don't want to be public. And for Intel, a lot of this means their code that trains the memory. They feel that that's pretty protected. Uh, and then a bunch of you know, CPU registers that are undocumented, uh, things like talking to the GPU and the management engine uh, that they don't want exposed in open source code. Um, this binary is configurable. We can you know, pass in various options to tell it to do things in different ways, turn on and off some device or internal uh, port. Uh, and that's how we you know, set it up to run for Chromebooks versus another system that might have a different hardware setup. And then finally, how do we update firmware on these systems? So you know, firmware, like Chrome OS is designed to be updated every six weeks, a new update is pushed out. Um, firmware can be updated as part of that, but by default it is not. Um, so firmware is a little bit different in that if you work on any other part of Chrome OS and you get your change up in Garrett, it gets, gets reviewed, and you get it in through the commit queue, then the next build will actually have your change in it. Well, for firmware, it's not quite that simple. Uh, firmware is a little bit more problematic if we screw up. It's really hard to uh, require users to recover their systems manually, um, which is fine if you have one system, but it's really a pain if you're a school that has 10,000. And um, so what we do is during the platform development of that SOC, we will branch the firmware. And then that firmware branch will live for the lifetime of all the platforms that are built based off of that particular SOC. And so the builders that are out there, you'll see the normal Chrome OS builders, but there's also a whole set of firmware builders that will check out and build firmware for each different board from the branch that it's assigned to. And once these builders produce that image, we send it to the test team. And they do a various testing, which we have. Some of these tests are automated, which are mostly designed to test verify boot behaviors, make sure that you can still enter developer mode, recovery mode still works, and it boots from USB like it's supposed to, and all these things. Um, that one's mostly automated. Depending on the firmware and the device we're actually shipping, there might be various manual tests that are run as well. Once the test team says that is okay, uh, 
that firmware image then gets checked into the, to the build, and then finally, the next image that's pushed out will contain that update. Um, so what does an update actually look like uh, for verified boot? Well, as I mentioned, the read-only firmware is locked, can't be updated. Um, so we have to get that right. It has to, boot, it has to be able to boot recovery mode. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be you know, completely power efficient or completely performant. It just needs to be able to boot recovery mode and recover the system. Then we have two slots for read-write firmware and two slots for, re, uh, for the kernels. And these slots, which is used, can be different. Uh, and the firmware is responsible for verifying them. So as a starting example, we have a system that just came out of the factory. Uh, it is booting from its RO firmware. It is selecting firmware A because that's what the NVRAM tells it to do. And then from there, it selects kernel A because that's what the GPT partition tells it to do. And if we were to push out that first update that contained an OS update only, it would still boot from firmware A because it hadn't been told to change to firmware B. Um, but there would be a GPT flag set that would tell it to try kernel slot B. And so it would attempt to verify and boot the kernel out of slot B. If the system boots up successfully, it'll set that flag and say, OK, it's successfully booted. And then subsequent boots will continue to use the same path. If the next update included a firmware update plus an OS update, because the firmware is bundled with the OS, you can't do a firmware update without an OS update. Um, so in this case, it will do the selection different on both sides. It will see a flag, and it'll try firmware B. And then it'll see a flag and try kernel A. If both of those boot successfully and it boots up, then flags will be set saying both of those were successful. And then every boot after that will continue to use this same path until the next update comes down and switches things again. And that's it. Here's a bunch of links to a bunch more details. Uh, we've given a number of talks on firmware in the past. And so if you can see the 2014 firmware summit, all this stuff is a little bit old, but there's a lot more detail on all the stuff that I talked about there and some of the design docs for some of the stuff that we have uh, built the firmware around. And then there's a Dory. Uh, questions about the root key and the read-only firmware flash that's root of trust. Uh, number one, is it a per-product key? It is a per-product key. We generate new keys for each product as we're going to ship them. We actually start with a, a set of keys for pre-production, and then right as we're about to go to production, we generate a whole new set of keys to make sure that devices that are pre-production, uh, they can be re-keyed, but they don't, uh, they don't automatically get the shipping image. Um, and then when we say it's in read-only flash, uh, the read-only property is ensured in hardware, but it's also sort of ensured in software. Read-only for uh, write protection for spy flash ships is sort of a two-step process. That pin that actually protects the flash ship is really just protecting a register inside the flash ship that tells it which region we want to protect with write protect and tells it to enable or disable. And so you actually have to combine the hardware and the software inside the chip to get the write protection settings that you're looking for. Anything else? Oh. So uh, the uh, the mechanism used to ensure write uh, read only, is it the same for read only copy of the flash and the uh, keys? Is it yes. the same region? It's the same region. That's okay. correct. And uh, what about the EC firmware? You mentioned that uh, uh, like we don't explicitly ensure that it is verified and whatever, but we just take its hash and compare it against some known thing. So do we ask the EC what your hash is and take its word for it? Or do, That's does the correct. host Yeah, we, we trust the EC because we assume it's running out of read-only code when it first comes out as well. And so we can trust that the hash that it gives us matches what, we, what it should. Um, and so all the ECs we've done have either internal flash within the EC or they use an external chip themselves. Uh, the trend in the industry is moving towards putting that EC flash on the host flash on the same spy chip, and so we've definitely got some potential complications dealing with some of those. Is the architecture based on uh, known attacks? And I mean, I guess, why did you come up with this architecture for? Um, um, so yeah, the security team did set out and created a threat model for what they wanted to protect against. Um, we looked at what was in the, in the industry when they first set out. Uh, the reality was that there wasn't a lot, like Intel's secure boot didn't exist. No one else was really paying a lot of attention to firmware security at all at the time. Um, so we set out with a threat model that was mostly about protecting against remote attacks. So a sustained, you know, greater than five minutes of physical access to the hardware, you could probably defeat the right protect and uh, change the read-only firmware on that system. Uh, and some of the newer technologies like Intel Secure Boot 
do attempt to do verification of the early firmware using a hardware enforced root key, uh, which would potentially give an extra level of protection. But it also prevents users from running their own firmware then. And that's been one of our core strengths is ensuring that users can own their device if they want to. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Verify Boot uh, prevents rolling back to uh, older versions? Yeah, so all of the keys that I described uh, in the key blocks are signed with a version. And so we can change the keys in all this read write pieces and we can increment the version to ensure that, and that version is a rollback counter stored in the TPM. And so once we've pushed out a new firmware that includes a key with a higher version, you can no longer boot older firmware that includes keys with the older version. That's right. So the TPM so is providing that rollback secure protection. Secure storage. Exactly. To we store use NVRAM account. with inside the TPM. I didn't. Uh, oh it, no, I've it's it's it really uh, not really a cryptographic function. It's a lockable memory. You write yeah. something into it and you lock, and you can't change it until you reboot. And when you reboot, you're in trusted code anyway. Yeah, exactly. We use the TPM slightly differently from a lot of the other secure boot attempts in firmware. We don't pass all of our code and do measurement through it, but we use it for some secure storage. Also, just curious. Um, what if um, it runs out of battery? Um, that it, it does it uh, have the risk of losing that no, storage? No, this is uh, complete NVRAM that's not uh, doesn't require power. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. How does this differ from what we might see with like Mac OS and Windows? I know Windows has a verified you know, TPM um, process as well. How does this differ? It's kind of a similar yeah. concept. Uh, Intel Secure Boot is what most of these people are using. Um, and that has a key that's actually in the SOC that's burned in at manufacturing time. That key is used to verify the boot block, the very first bit of code that runs. And then it's again, it's up to the firmware in that case to ensure that it's verifying every next step that it goes through all the way up through the kernel. And so a lot of these systems do verification using the actual TPM, where they pass all of the code they're going to execute through the TPM and have it measure that code, um, rather than doing verification with a root of trust that's read-only, where you can guarantee you're running safe code. They measure the code they're about to run and then check it at the end and make sure it was all safe. Saying that Intel have the have the key that burned down in the manufacturing time, does that mean that uh, OEN or ODN usually have their own kind of like another pair to sign their firmware? Yes, that's correct. They they have a, a key manifest that they sign with the boot block, and inside that manifest there can be different keys for either different ODNs building that same uh, system uh, or for other designs that might want to do things. Then uh, are we considering using that as well? Um, We've been resistant to using BootGuard simply because it takes away user freedom to replace their firmware entirely. Um, it's definitely under investigation for some projects. There are some scenarios where if users don't own their device, maybe it's not that bad if they can't completely change their firmware. This might sound like a basic question, but like, ha what percent of users have been replacing their firmware, and <laughs> why would like, in what context would you want to do that? That's a good question. We actually don't know metrics on how many users have actually done it. There is a rather uh, active and healthy community of people who um, do build from coreboot.org. There's a few people who have taken it upon themselves to build images from coreboot.org for different boards and make them available for other people that don't want to figure out how to build their own. And so a lot of people use these to actually boot Windows um, so they can play games on their device. Sometimes they may have gotten a Chromebook, like a, a you know student got a Chromebook as a gift, and they're like, but I can't run Minecraft on it. And so they might want to you know, either either jailbreak it to run Linux so they can run Minecraft or to actually put Windows on it and run more than just Minecraft. Um, so a lot of the people are looking to use the device as something that's not Chrome OS. And so maybe they, you know, got it and didn't like Chrome OS or they got it as a gift and didn't intend to ever get it. Okay, sorry. So that's in the case for someone who got a device that they didn't actually want. Like it's possible, and some people have experimented with it just because they would like to learn about firmware. Um, there's more and more devices are coming with Secure Boot enabled, where users have no ability to go play with it anymore. And so we're slowly, like as a, as I was growing up, I played with the firmware on my devices, and if I didn't have that ability, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so we want to make sure that we empower that next generation of firmware developers so they can play with their device. 
But there is also a matter of principle, right? Don't be evil. Uh, you own you own the device. That's right. Yeah. In principle, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, and and we go through significant pains to enable this steps. We could really lock things down, and it would be somewhat easier on us. Um, it would also make us a much more attractive target for people that wanted to hack us. And so, by providing a way for people to download the firmware and play with it, they don't feel they need to break the current firmware to do it. All right. Thank you very much, Duncan.